Old Testament lesson this morning comes from both the 8th and 9th chapters of the book of Jeremiah, verses 18 and following. And honestly, it's a word of grief. Now, depending on your version of the Bible, just above verse 18, there may be a heading that reads, the prophet mourns for the people. But because prophets were and are, in my opinion still, those who speak on behalf of God. I wonder, is it the prophet who mourns? Or is it God? And if it is God, then what exactly is God mourning? They're good questions, and they are those that I invite you to keep in mind as we hear now these words from God's servant, Jeremiah. My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick. But hark, the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not with her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images and all their foreign idols? The harvest is past, and the summer is ended, but we are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people I hurt, I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? If so, then why then 
has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes fountains of tears so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I don't know why I remember them. I mean, there's no real reason for me to remember them. But I remember them. All those little golden book brand books that my grandparents kept at their house when I was a kid. So many, in fact, that you would have thought that they were single-handedly keeping the little golden books industry in the black. Who knew that little books could be such big business? I suspect that the more likely reason my grandparents bought all of those books, though, wasn't so much because they wanted to keep every child's favorite book publisher afloat, so much as it had to do with the fact that they wanted to keep their house standing. You see, they helped raise me and my two sisters, and when three hyperactive kids who normally have the run of acres and acres of farmland to themselves end up stuck indoors during one of the rainiest summers on record in Mississippi, well, they will tear up a house faster than it takes any demolition crew to just start the job. And so I remember one of these summers, the rain and the winds keeping my sisters and I from exploring out of doors, being inside, and my grandparents did the kind of place that smells like dust and, in our case, Virginia Slim's cigarette smoke, and reading little golden books. Classics we read, like uh, The Pokey Little Puppy or Scuffy the Tugboat, The Little Red Hen. Do you remember those? Yes. (laughs) But my favorite was the one about the Band-Aids. And yes, you did hear that correctly. (laughs) My favorite little golden book was Dr. Dan, the Bandage Man. And, and maybe it was because I was a little boy and Band-Aids were practically second clothing for me, like the time I tried to jump a briar patch in my three-speed mongoose. Or, or maybe it was because Band-Aids were a sign of being a hero to my young self. I, I thought that book was the best. In fact, I, I went looking for it a, a few weeks ago, and I found it on Amazon, and you too can be the proud own owners of Dr. Dan the Bandage Man for only four ninety nine plus tax. Of course, I- I'm sure you're wondering what a book like this is actually about, though, right? And it's simple. You see, one day Dan is out playing with his friends when, when he scratches his finger, you know, ouch. And so Dan, he runs crying to his mom, who uses a miracle device the likes of which little Dan has never seen in his whole little life. A a, a Band-Aid brand adhesive bandage, which his mom says, and I quote, will fix him up better than new and quick as a wink. And, And then for the rest of the book, little Dr. Dan, who between you and me could be up for malpractice due to his lack of an MD, he is able to fix not just his friends and his sister, but even his toys with nothing more than a Band-Aid. Better than new and quick as a wink. Of course, adults, we know that a Band-Aid doesn't really fix anything, though, does it? It doesn't make anything better than new, and it certainly doesn't make anything better quick as a wink. the very least all a band-aid does is cover up what's hurt, right? At the very most, it keeps whatever is hurting from getting infected. Unfortunately, it's not like when we're kids and the power of the band-aid knows no bounds. Or is it the case that us adults, we do still believe in the power of band-aids? It's just that we need more of them the older we get. The reason I ask a question like this is because in the Old Testament lesson that we heard earlier, 
I think it's about the Israelites finally having run out of band-aids. And it has been a long time coming. Maybe the first time the Israelites looking for band-aids, maybe as a people, was probably back in 1 Samuel. Because there, the elders of Israel, they go to Samuel and they ask for a king who will govern them. And, and they want a king for a lot of reasons. They want to be like other nations. Samuel's old. The judges who were supposed to help settle all the disputes among them, well, they just aren't really working out any. And so they want a king. Mainly, though, I think they want a king so that they don't lose what they have, which is independence, freedom from slavery in Egypt that God granted them, and their home, the land of promise that God led them to. Have you ever been afraid of losing something? Yeah, me too. A good king, though, he'll help you hold on to all of that. He'll do other things, too, but at the very least, he'll help you hold on to what you're afraid of losing. But a king's really just a band-aid, isn't he? For the larger problem, it covers up the real problem, which is fear. And it only does it for so long. And, and all the while, the wound, the problem, will get bigger, you know? It'll keep growing. It will grow and it will grow until it is too big to be covered up with just one Band-Aid. And so you've got to turn to more. You've got to put more on the wound. And that, that's what the Israelites do. First, the Band-Aids are, are kings. And then the Band-Aids are idols. And then when the idols don't work, the Band-Aids become alliances with all the other people around Israel who will protect them. And then when the alliances don't work anymore, it's ruin. And that is why Jeremiah is so upset in our Old Testament lesson. He's not called the weeping prophet for nothing. He can see that all the band-aids that God's people are using, they just are not working. And, and when you have a big wound like theirs, you know, the kind that, that bleeds around the edges, when you look at something like that, who wouldn't want to cry? The people have tried to use Band-Aids to heal their wounds when the whole time God was standing there hoping, longing, that they would turn to him. And so when Jeremiah asks, it's a famous line in chapter 8, verse 22, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? The answer is, of course there is. It's just that it doesn't matter when you no longer need a Band-Aid and instead need reconstructive heart surgery. All the Band-Aids in the world won't fix that. We still apply Band-Aids to our biggest problems too, don't we? I do. Over and over again. For the young people that I normally work with as they get ready to go to college, to leave high school, it's the right college or major that we think we need. You know, if I just choose the right path, it will solve all the problems. It's just a band-aid, though, for the fact that we're frightened about going out into a big, wide world that we don't understand. And sometimes the band-aids are relationships that will fix things, right? I don't know about you, but I have thought there will be people in my life who would fix the problems and the wounds. But nobody else can fix us as much as we can fix ourselves. Only God can do that. And the problems, they don't really go away the older you get either. According to my wise and sage little golden book courting grandparents, the band-aids just change names. 
As you get older, it's the right house. Maybe that'll solve the problem. In the right neighborhood with the right schools, the right car. Maybe even it's that vacation that will fix things because, you know, things have just been so hard lately. And if the two of us can just get away, that'll fix it. And then ultimately there's the fear of death. Have you ever thought of all the band-aids we use to cover up that fear? You know, the older I get, it's better diet, more exercise, exercise, more doctor's visits, et cetera, et cetera, forever to sort of prolong and band-aid over the fact that one day I will die. It's coming. And then at the end of that, what would all of the band-aids that I've used for so long even matter? They won't. The wounds, they just seem to always keep growing, don't they? They keep getting bigger. No matter how many band-aids you use. And, and I want to use as an example something from the wider world, I suppose. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Um, as some of you know, Holly and I are getting ready to have a little girl. And so I've paid a lot of attention lately to what's been called that Me Too movement in the news. Maybe you've heard about it where women have come forward. They've had the strength to share their stories about how men have assaulted and harassed them. And it has led to arrests. It's led to firings. It's led to the removal of people from positions of power that require integrity. And those are all good things. But I wonder, are we just band-aiding over the wound? Rather than look at the fact that this has happened for a long time to women and girls. I admit that I don't know. I, I'm young. I, I don't know. But it, that kind of world where we band-aid things over scares me. The more I think about a little one on the way. I'm afraid that most of the things we do as a society, most of the things that I do personally, they're just band-aids. What, what are the band-aids in your life? If you're like me, you've got a lot of them. Are they really working? If you're like me too, I'll, I'll bet that they're not. Of course, you may be wondering where the good news is in all of this, right? This is not exactly a very hopeful passage. <laughs> but there is good news. It's great news, actually. Because when you've used up all the band-aids and the box is empty, just like for the Israelites, God's not going anywhere. God is still there, inviting you into that journey of healing with him, if you'll let him. On, on the cover of your bulletin, you may have noticed a, a band-aid, and that is intentional. Because as the choir leads us in our closing hymn, I want you maybe to just take a moment, maybe write about something you're using as a Band-Aid. I'm going to do that too. And, and cast it on the altar if you want after service is over. Sort of maybe a symbolic way of saying, you know, these things don't work quite so well as we think we, they do in covering up our hurts. If not, take it with you, maybe as a reminder of the same thing, that they don't work quite so well as we think. May we give our wounds over to God. Amen.